guys fired up? You ready for Christmas? It's almost here, y'all. You know how you can tell it's getting close? Because this guy starts showing up right here. Take a look in three, two, one. It's going to be on the screen. There he is, the elf on the shelf. Yeah, I'm watching you. There's nothing creepy about that. That's how you can tell. Now listen, let me, full disclosure, I cannot confirm nor deny that my wife and I have resorted to the elf on the shelf. We're just going to leave it there, but we have to have some, some ground rules. If the elf on the shelf visits your house, and that is completely your call, please, dads, for the love of donuts, do not take it to this level right here. <laughs> All right, can we, can, we just, can we just accept that that is a little bit over the top? Or this right here? Please don't go. Y'all, that's just creepy. I mean, just look at his eyes. That will haunt you for a thousand lifetimes. You will picture that guy's eye. Is there anything creepier than that, Ryan? Can we find anything at all? Okay. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Sorry. That's when I had hair. But uh, today we're looking at Advent week two. Last week, we lit the candle of hope. Today, we light the candle of love, and this is so awesome because I've confessed to you, many, many Christmases come and go, and they whiz by me, and I look at my wife, and I go, what just happened? Did, did, I didn't get it. I didn't get in the Christmas spirit. I, can't, I even tried starting the Christmas music on Labor Day, and I just still couldn't quite get it. I was happy when the Halloween decorations were quickly replaced with Christmas stuff, and some days, it just doesn't get there for me. And I, I don't know if that's just me or too busy or whatever, but Advent helps us pause and helps us have that expectancy. We yearn like the old church, like Israel, even before the church proper with a Messiah. When will you come? These people knew all about waiting, and that's what we do. But it has a twofold purpose. Remember, you also get to look forward to the return of Christ. Advent has a dual meaning. Don't miss that. This week, we talk about love, the candle of love. Now, you don't have to go very far. You can go in a store, you can be in your car, you can come to church, and you are already hearing Christmas music, right? How many Christmas songs are actually love songs? If you really start listening for it, it's crazy. In fact, some of them are cheap imitate. They're like cheesy love songs that are disguised as Christmas songs. So we're going to play a game just to get you warmed up, because I know you're cold. <laughs> If y'all tithe more, we'd actually turn the heat on. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just. Come on. Come on. I'm so sorry. I'm... That just slipped out. Sorry. Elliot told me to say that, so. I'm kidding. You guys are awesome. You're faithful. You're good. You're good. We're going to play a game. And what we're going to do is I'm going to start a Christmas song, a love song, basically. And you're going to finish it. You're going to tell me what the title is, Okay. Gonna be real easy. This first one's nice and easy. Well, the fire is slowly dying. And whoa, who, who nailed that? Let it snow. Nice, Louise, of course. That's awesome. Let it snow. Good. You can name that in three notes, apparently. <laughs> Let's try another one. Later on, we'll conspire. At, nice. Went to Cademan? <laughs> Welcome, Cademan. That is awesome. All right, get a little harder here. This one's, I got to get this in my head. At the Christmas party hop, mistletoe hung for, yes, nice, rock and roll, jingle bell rock. You guys are, okay, all right, last one. This one's a little hard. I'm, I'm not gonna, just going to give you a tiny bit. Name this in three notes. We're snuggled up together like two birds of a feather would be. It is slay right. Good job. Wow. I am so impressed. These had all one thing in common, y'all. They all dealt with couples wanting to cuddle and mistletoe, and they wanted to just, they either dealt with loving someone, being loved by someone, or wanting to be loved by somebody <laughs> under that goofy mistletoe, right? All of these, and these are here, there's nothing wrong with love, and there's nothing wrong with celebrating it in December. In fact, if you read Brides Magazine, which I don't, but if you do... <laughs> Man, I almost stepped in that. If, if you do happen to read Brides Magazine, 19% of all engagements happen in December. 19%. It is the number one month for engagements. Did you know that? It's not February. It's not Valentine's Day. Sorry, Mr. Cupid, little cuddly fat cherubim with his little, with his little arrows or whatever. He loses out. Did you know what the number one day 
to be proposed is Christmas Eve. Yes, that is the night of love. And we're going to have an awesome Christmas Eve service here. It is going to be very, very cool, but it's not going to deal with cupids or love or anything like that. Guess what the number two day is? No, Christmas Day. Number three? New Year's. Yes. Number four, falling in a distant fourth, Valentine's Day. So that may have the corner of the market on romance and stuff, but real love apparently is, is in December. Now, hear me. There is nothing wrong with love. There's nothing wrong with love songs. The problem comes when we think that cuddling and kissing under the mistletoe is what Christmas is about. You hear me? That is where we miss it because that is not what love is about. The true meaning of love at Christmas time is God writing himself into the story, taking on flesh and becoming sin for us years later on the cross. Now think about that. This is true, sacrificial, faithful, unending agape love. And it is the love that the world needed, and it came in the form of Jesus. So that's what we want to focus on. Through all the clutter, through all the noise, let that be. God's love from the beginning was painted all the way from the Garden of Eden, both before and after the fall of man, all the way through the flood, all the way through the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, all the way up until today. God's love is so evident. It is, it is on every page of his book, his greatest love letter, written for us. It took him coming, being born in a lowly stable, being dying on a cross, being raised again from the grave. It took that kind of love to shatter the chains of sin, of death, of evil. It took that. That is incredible, deep love. But let me caution you. This love is not just a feeling, okay? This love is more than a feeling. All right, you, more than a feeling. I know you were thinking it, so we'll just, we'll just sing it. Y'all were giggling. I didn't want it. That's why I didn't write it in my notes this way, because I didn't want you to think Boston on that. <laughs> love is more than a feeling. Here in this case, God's love is the story of his love in action. It is action, okay? Hear me. Love without action is nothing. It's a clanging symbol. If you do not... If you do not demonstrate this love, and that's what we're going to focus on today, what does it mean to accept God's love, to experience it, and then to share it, to do something with it? This is the love that we talk about, the second gift of Christmas that we unwrap today. Now, if you were here with us last week, as we began our journey through the Advent season toward Christmas, we unwrapped the gift of hope. And it was awesome, it was beautiful, and you learned that the word Advent literally means the coming or the arrival. And it was beautiful, and it was what... Israel was longing for their Messiah when he came, and, and they had that anticipation, that ancient longing. And we learned that Advent is not, not an extension of Christmas. It's not about that. It's not about holiday sales going longer and Black Friday stretching into Black Month or whatever. It's not about sales. Hear me. That, you know, I got to buy presents too. It's nothing bad. I'm not saying we're evil for doing that. But when we demonstrate that for our kids and we're stressed out and we're making that, that's the priority, I think we're blowing it. I think we're blowing it. Sometimes that's how I get to where I'm, I'm so frazzled. And I, y'all, tomorrow we drive to the happiest place on earth. Yeah, we, no, no. Or Leesburg, Florida. We got to go there because that's where my family is. And that's, I'm going to visit that. And we got to pack. We got, and believe me, it's all in my mind. We got to go. Yeah, we're going to go pay homage to Mickey. We're going to see him a couple, couple days, whatever, and then we'll be back. But it is so easy to be focused on these things, to be stressed about it. And to people look, Daddy, what's wrong? Because I got this little furrowed brow right here. You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, Daddy, I'm not in a bad mood. You know, just leave me alone, right? You see what I'm saying? And we miss this love. Thank you that you were there with me. I understand. I feel your pain. We look at Advent, and we see that Advent links the past, the present, and the future. And that is what we do. We join the church worldwide, not just Potter's Hand. Not just churches in Apex and Cary and Holly Spring, church worldwide, we should come together and be overflowing with love, a people who is known by our love. And every time we light a candle, I hope that each flame brings us a little bit closer to acknowledging his return, because that's what it's about. Who's my volunteer this week? We got CJ? All right, come on up. We're going to light a candle here. This first candle that we lit last week was a candle of hope. CJ, how you doing, buddy? You know how to work that thing? Do I need to stand back? You good? Got it? No pressure. We're all just staring at you. 
There's no, no problem at all. Go ahead. Got it? Got it? There you go. You got it? Squeeze it? Yes. Good. Candle of hope. Awesome. And this one right here. Good job. Nice. Awesome. Give CJ a hand, guys. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. As we light this candle, what we're talking about today is the candle of love. And it is not just that surfacey love that we're all familiar with, but a true, deep, and abiding love where we start to grasp and we try to actually wrap our minds around how deep, how wide, how long, how amazing is God's love for us. So as we unwrap this gift today, think about that. I want you to go back to your childhood, or maybe you have kids, and picture them unwrapping their Christmas presents. Oh, what a glorious sight. And they tear into these things, right? I mean, they go, they go all out, and, and they are just so happy, and they can't get it. And then they open it, and that their intensity and excitement is matched only by how quickly they can destroy the box and get to what's inside, the toy or the game, right? There is nothing crueler in this world than giving a toy that needs batteries, <laughs> you've done it, and not giving the batteries. That is, that is like, you want to talk about a roller coaster, a peak of emotions. The only thing that can match that cruelty, that dastardly wickedness, is giving your kids a gift that says these dreaded words, some adult assembly required. <laughs> In my house, that gift stays in the box. Because there will be no adult assembly. I tell the kids, I'm sorry, y'all, put it back, or call Tion or somebody, because I can't do it. We're not going to do it. That is, a, that is a frustration. But they're still so excited as they tear into their, their box. And that's what we want to look at today as we dive into this gift of love. Do we have that kind of excitement? The first thing you do with the gift, that, any gift that you're given, is you accept it. And that's what we do with God's love. That is the first step. Accept his love. The first scripture we look at today is so profound, most of you, I bet, have it memorized. And if you don't, I'm going to put it up in a minute and we're going to read it together. But I'm just going to say the scripture reference and see if you hear it in your head. You ready? John 3.16. Most of you know it, right? Yeah. All right, let's put it up. Let's read it together. If you're new to the faith, we'll all say it together. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Y'all, do we really grasp the significance of this verse? Do we really? This verse right here summarizes the Bible. Think about it. No other verse in Scripture so adequately encapsulates God's love and his plan for the world. It is summed up right there. That's why it's the verse that every evangelist quotes. That's why the church seems to make this their scripture. God's love. It is so amazing. This is the most extravagant. Listen to how my, my David Jeremiah study Bible puts it. God gave the most extravagant thing he could to demonstrate his love for lost humankind. Summoning and then sending his only begotten son to go pay your debt. Wow. How beautiful is that? What sacrificial, holy, complete love is this? Could we do that with our son? I think about this. The message of this verse is the core of what we believe. And that's why it's important today we start right here. Before we even go into the other scriptures, and I'm going to throw a lot at you today. Before we go any further, this is the message. God loved the world. He gave his son. Boom, right there. When you accept that gift, you get his spirit. You get salvation. That's how it works. Now, the first thing, it seems so simple. It seems so basic. Accept God's love, right? But for some people, notice it's not easy. I didn't use that word. It may be basic, but it's not easy for some of us because some of us have resisted accepting this. Maybe you've wrestled with this part of the gospel for years. Maybe you've got a family member who... Man, you've shared love, you've been with them, you've prayed for them, and for some reason they have resisted accepting the Lord. They've resisted surrendering their life to him. And you know what I'm talking about. They've got some, maybe they've got issues. Maybe some other here, maybe you've been burned by human love. And you think, if that's love, I want nothing to do it. Or maybe you had a bad father, and the, the thought of relating to a heavenly father is just so foreign to you, it doesn't even cross your mind. 
Man, I get that. I totally get that. So does God. Or maybe you've neglected the gift. You've thought about it, but you whisper to yourself. Or worse, the enemy comes and whispers to you, you can't make that decision. You can't accept. Do you know what you've done? I know who you are. That's the enemy. Maybe you're bought into the lies. You think, you don't know my dark secrets. You don't know my pain. You don't know my past. I am unworthy to receive this gift. You don't know, pastor. And to that, I say, you're right. I I don't know, but God does. God sees, he knows, and he understands, and nothing shocks him. Nothing. You are always welcome at the foot of the cross to accept his love. Always. The ground is level there for all of us. Accept it. Even if you think it's tough, even if you feel you're unlovable, God sees and he offers still this precious gift of his son. And that is the very first thing. No matter what challenges you have, no matter what hurts you have, God's love can handle them. I promise. And I'm going to show you how you know that in about five minutes. This is going to be amazing. So wherever you are, first I encourage you to accept it. Once you accept a present, guess what you do next? You get to experience it. Oh, yes. The next thing we do is we experience his love. During this Advent season, I want us to experience God's love, not in some shallow, cheesy, surfacey way, not like a little snuggled up together like birds, not, not like that, not a little love song, but in a real, deep, and genuine way. And it is so easy to be distracted. I know. I get it. I've been there. It is so easy to not experience his love because you're so stressed out or you read the headlines and you honestly wonder, God, can you really overcome this? There's so much evil. How does love win? I get it. I see it too. I watch the news a couple hours every day. Probably shouldn't, but I do. And it's just one of those things. And you fall asleep to it and you wake up here in the headlines. You think, man, there's so much hatred, so much darkness in the world. It's so easy to start worrying. Worry about tomorrow. Worry about next week. Next month, how much weight you got to lose after this month and things like that. It's so easy to get stressed out and to be concerned. But here's the, here's, the, the, here's the beautiful thing about God. God is not asking you to ignore that. He is not asking you to sweep it under the carpet and pretend your fears and your stresses don't exist. God is inviting you to bring those to him. What a beautiful, incredible God. No other faith claims that. He says, Bring it to me. I'll take it. I want you to experience And in return, he gives you joy, peace, love, and incredible fruit of the Spirit that show he is real. He invites you to bring our pains and our stresses and our worries to him and surrender those deepest concerns. That is awesome. That allows you to begin to experience, to allow him to fill you with his love. And the good news here is that his love comes through Jesus, and it is absolutely enough. Let's break this down. Look with me and what Paul has to say here in Romans chapter 8. I'll put up the first verse for you. It says here, we are more than conquerors through him who, what? Loved. Him who loved us. You need to understand something about this. When Paul says more than conquerors, the phrase translated here is literally coming from a Greek compound word, hupernikomen. Hupernikomen is an amazing word. It, let's break it up. The first word is hooper, and that means over and above, like you have overshot the moon. The other word is nike, meaning to overcome. So when you put them together, you literally get you are victorious above and over and far beyond. That is how much you are a a conqueror because of his love, a super conqueror. But that's not where Paul stops. He goes on to talk about this love. Look at verse 38 with me. For I am persuaded, your Bible may even say convinced, okay? Either one is awesome. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, your Bible may say demons there, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's some amazing stuff. Get ready for your truth grenades here. They're gonna come rapid fire here. When Paul says... I am convinced, or I am persuaded. He is literally using a perfect Greek tense here to say, I have absolutely, I have become this. I have become this, and I remained this convinced of God's love. He's saying, I don't know about God's love. I have put it on like a garment, okay? He has lived in it. Why? Because Paul has experienced love. 
Think about it. Every day of his life is a roller coaster, up and down. He's been beaten many times, caned, shipwrecked, put in jail, released, put in jail again, put his feet in stocks, starving. He's been freezing cold. He's been at the potter's hand in December. He's been, he's been uh, bitten by a poisonous viper and lived. And people looked at him and said, what is this man? I mean, you name it. He has been, st- uh, everything you can think about has happened to this guy. And he is the one who writes from jail, I am convinced of God's love. It is so awesome. When you get your mind off of all the junk in this world and focus on God's love, it changes you. You literally experience this. And he says, when this verse, he writes that I am convinced, he's saying I have supreme, utmost, utter confidence that nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing. Not a tax bill. Not a bad report from your doctor. Not bad news from one of your kids. Nothing. can. It is the number one premier, most powerful love. And it can't be contained or constrained or held back by evil or death, none of that. But it's love to be experienced like Paul. So let me ask, have you experienced that? We'll get to how we can actually do that in practical ways before we finish today. Let's go back to that kid on Christmas Day. What Paul's saying here is this gift is not a gift to be experienced once and then set back on the shelf. What he's saying is this gift is one that you tear into and every day you open this and you revel in God's love to the point like let's say you had a kid or maybe it was you and you were given that favorite stuffed animal, your little whoopee or whatever you called it. Not that I called mine whoopee, but maybe I did. And it's one of those fluffy things and you slept with it and you carried it with you to the mall and it was in the car with you and you, you were with it so much that you rubbed like the fur off of it. You know what I'm talking about? Do we have a picture of one of those, Ryan? I think like, like one of these where you could... Look at it. Hey, never mind. That's creepy. Just take that down. But you, you get the bad idea. That's a horrible example. But it's one of those things where you've rubbed off the fur because you have loved this gift so much. That is just a, a fraction of how we're supposed to feel with and experience God's love. Let this season of Advent allow us to embrace God's love fully. How deep, how, lo- how wide, how long, and how amazing it is. Which brings us to the last point. Once you've experienced it, we are under obligation, but a joyful obligation to share it. We share his love. This is critical to the gospel. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in love? (laughs) Dangerous question. If you're married, you better be nodding, okay? (laughs) Your spouse is looking at you. All right, I'll ask you again so you get this right. Have you ever been in love? (laughs) Absolutely, so much. When you're in love, it shows. You shout it from the mountaintop. You remember Elf? I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. And he just goes, it's like, wow, it's so obnoxious. Or you put it on a jumbotron. Or or this modern day and age, you put it on Facebook, you know, or you Instagram it or tweet it, Twitter it, woofer, whatever, and you get get your, your, your message out, I am in love, and I don't care who knows it. And that's what we do because you can't hold back love. You want it to show. Love, love simply overflows. That's why we have poetry about it and, and musicals and endless novels written about this topic and love song after love song about the topic of love because it overflows. When you are in love, it's supposed to show. I'll say it again. When you are in love, it is supposed to show, okay? So you can, this is where you put your arm around your spouse if you want or, you know, whatever. Here's the deal. This is the amazing part. The gift of God's love is for sharing. It is so, this is the great paradox of God's love, all right? Try to wrap your mind around this. This is the one thing I can think of, that the more you try to share it, it doesn't leave you with less, it leaves you with more. What? Wrap your mind around that. Take a picture of that and tweet that. That is good stuff. This is the one gift. When you share God's love, it doesn't leave you with less. It actually fills you up somehow supernaturally. It leaves you with more, more joy, more peace. I can tell when you've been with the Lord because it shows on your face. I can te- you can tell when I have. I hope. It shows. You can just, you know, ask your kids. They'll know. They'll know if you're having a great day, if you're walking in the Spirit. Like that. They'll, they'll, they'll know these things. So it's the natural. Once you accept it, you experience the natural overflow is to share it. Now let's go back to Scripture and see what John says many years later in 1 John 4, 9, 11. He says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. 
This is love. Not that we love God, catch that, but that he loved us. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Don't miss verse 11. This is the challenge. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to occasionally love our neighbor. Oh, yours doesn't say that? We also ought to love one another if they're like us. Oh, yours doesn't have that additional verse either? No, man. Church, the lost world will want what we have when they see what we have is genuine. They will know we are Christians because of our love, not because of our great arguments, not because of our incredible way of taking over Facebook and shutting down a room, driving out and getting unfriended. It's not about that. Why are you laughing? Have you done that? Okay. You, you don't have to raise your hand. It's good. Uh, confession is good for the soul. Let me ask you a question. With verse 11, how are you doing with that? Because there's our challenge. How are you doing with that? If you had to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, what number would you give yourself? Don't say it out loud. This is between you and the Lord. You have five? Could be worse. <laughs> Could be better. Seven, two. When you think of yourself, do you picture yourself as a believer who genuinely, affectionately, and sacrificially loves your neighbor? It's a great, great word. Thank you, First John, for this. What a beautiful challenge. What does love look like for you this season? How do you experience this? It could mean something as simple as spending quality time with family. Let's just start there, a nice easy one. We could all do that. It may mean that. It may mean going back and, and spending time with family. Maybe family, sometimes spending time with family is awesome. Sometimes it's not. I've been there, I get it. It's okay, we'll pray for each other during this season of Advent. Yes, we will. It may mean something simple like that. It may mean reconnecting with an old friend who's drifted away. It may mean just, you know what, God put somebody on your heart, you sense that they might be lonely at this time, and you reach out to them. That's showing an act of love. It's genuine, it's simple, and very doable. It may mean taking it a step further and forgiving someone that you know you need to forgive. Or, let's flip it, it may mean going to that person and asking forgiveness for hurting them. You know how you can tell if you need to do this? Because a person just flashed through your mind. A name or a face, just, that's how you can tell. And if no one did, all right, good on you, mate. Pretty good. But that's how you can tell. Like when a pastor talks about sin and this one sin that keeps besetting you and holding you back, you know how you can tell what it is? Because it's the one that just raced through your mind. Yeah, wow, man, that's deep. That's not even in the notes, y'all. That's free. That, this, is, this, is, this is good stuff from God's Word. These are, let's bring it down to, to the challenge here, okay? Let's say you want to show love this week. Maybe it's something as simple as doing something anonymously. We have a tree back there full of over 75, 75 blessings, 70 anonymous ways of people who are hurting this time of year, who need a touch from you, from the Lord, using you. And it's anonymous. And you have a chance to take one, two, or three. Last year, I think they were gone in like a day. Bring them back in two weeks. It'll tell you what. It'll give you an age group. It'll give you something. We had over 100 boxes up here for children's, for the Operation Christmas Child. And y'all, you did it. You took them. You filled them up. You brought them back. You guys are awesome. You are so faithful, and I love you for that. This is another way. If you're looking for one tangible way that you could do something, and here's the beautiful part, that no one knows. Oh, man, that's awesome. When you do something that only God gets the glory, maybe you're in drive through and you pick up the tab for the guy behind you. Man, that's happened to me, and it, it made my day, especially when I see that pH magnet on the back of your car, and I'm like, "Woo! those people love God, and God gets some glory. But no human does. It's a beautiful thing. These are small ways that you can show and experience God's love. So here's my challenge in a very practical way. I want you to think of one way right now that you can share God's love this week, Okay? and then do it. 
Think and keep your heart and your eyes and your mind open for that chance. Look for it. This is your challenge. Should you choose to accept it? That's your challenge. This will help us keep our focus on the season of love. It'll be not about cheesy, sappy love songs. It'll be about showing God's love. Speaking of showing God's love, you ever been on an interstate in California? There is an interstate called Santa Monica Boulevard, Freeway 10, San Bernardino. It goes by many names, and it is notorious for its traffic. Traffic is so bad on this highway that they have actually, engineers have been called in to build extra lanes on this interstate, not to drive on, but for police to come along and clear the inevitable accidents that are going to happen that day. And the police build fences around the accident scene. You know why they have to do that? Because people slow down and rubberneck and want to check out the accident. I know you have never done that, but apparently somebody does that. This is known as the ultimate driving frustration. One Sunday earlier this year, there was something amazing that happened. Traffic came to a complete stop, a dead standstill. The reason wasn't an accident. The reason was something far more unusual. The traffic delay was caused by a biker gang. This biker gang, over 100 strong, got together and intentionally spread out across every lane and started to back off the throttle and slow down. And they kept slowing down and kept slowing down, forcing the cars behind them to slow down until finally they stopped their bikes altogether, got off, and put their kickstand down. Traffic came to a dead standstill for 10 to 15 minutes. Now, before you start thinking a brawl or something horrible is about to happen, some stereotypical biker gang... I want to tell you the reason for this standstill was a marriage proposal. A marriage proposal. The lovebirds' names were actually Hector Martinez and Paige Hernandez. Here he is on the left, kneeling down and proposing. And here's something else going on. I get girls, does this mean yes? Did he say yes? Is that what this is? Because there's a little kissy going on here. This happened in the middle of the interstate. Think of I-40, okay? Now quadruple it. Okay, now you've got Freeway 10. This is happening. Now, after this happened, they started burning rubber, and they released like pink smoke, I think. You'll see this in the next photo. And, and it's this huge thing, and you see the traffic, and it was awesome. And they were so happy, and everybody loved it, except the police, <laughs> who weren't nearly as amused as the biker gang or the drivers who were stopped behind them trying to get home. But you know what? Sometimes love calls for outrageous acts. This is what Jesus did. Think about this. He stopped everything. He, he wrote himself into his story, becoming his story, and changing everything. What an outrage. There was no greater outrageous act of love ever than this. Have you accepted this? Have you experienced it? And have you shared it? Because those are the three, that's the gospel. Accept it. Remember, no pride here. I am one beggar just telling another where I found free food, and it is awesome. Hey, you hungry? Come with me. Look at this. Look at this buffet. To not accept this is foreign to me. It's like going to Golden Corral, and it's paid for. You sit me at the buffet, and you go, ah, don't touch. No, no, dive in. Are you kidding me? It's paid for. What an amazing gift. He came, loved us so much, he became like us, to die for us so he could save us? What love is this? It's the Advent love. That's why we light a candle 2,000 years later to remember it and to look for his return. If you haven't accepted this love today, you can. Come see me. We're going to, in just a minute, we're going to sing one final song together, and then we're done. It's your chance. The altar is going to be open. You can come pray. Many people do that week after week. No one will bother you. You just come. It's between you and the Lord. Maybe you want to stand and sing and just worship during this last song. Maybe you want to talk about what this love is or being baptized or, or joining the church, whatever. Just be obedient, okay? Let's thank God for this love together. Pray with me. Lord, you are so good. God, we thank you for your love. You loved us when we were so unlovely. 
unlovable in our own eyes, but you have never seen us that way. God, I thank you that you didn't just leave us floundering in our sin, but you provided a way. You are so worthy of our highest praise today, and we give it to you. God, I pray for every heart in this room, that if they're already on fire for you, Lord, that you would stoke the flames, Lord. But if there is a a soul within the sound of my voice that hasn't accepted this love, God, let them do it today. Tug on their heart. Holy Spirit, be all over them and allow them to accept your free gift today. Lord, we give you our worship. We thank you for this time. And we pray it in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.